We are so privileged to be your children. And as we come together as a church and study, we plead, Lord, for more of your spirit to be poured upon us, that, Lord, we may fulfill our position with prophetic destiny. Abide with us now, we pray, and we thank you, Father, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I am excited that we have the opportunity and the privilege of studying the Word of God together. Amen. Amen. We have something special going for us today, and we'll get there in a moment. But let's take our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Isaiah. What book did I say? Isaiah. We're going to Isaiah 54. We're going to lay a foundation uh, today, and then we're going to transition on. All right, let's go to Isaiah, the 54th chapter. And I believe that the words of the psalmist, God intends for them to be the desires and the breath and the attitude of our hearts. You remember what the psalmist said? He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you happy to be in God's house? Amen. Are you happy to be a part of God's family that he's getting ready to finish this work? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles and go to Isaiah 54. Now, I told you that God has been speaking to my heart and he's been showing us that he's getting ready to do something great and marvelous in this little church. In order to do that, there are things that has to start developing inside of us. In Isaiah 54, here's one of those places that the Bible has shown to us the glory that awaited Israel, but the glory that is to await us. Isaiah 54, beginning in verse 1. We'll start there. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Are you there? Amen. amen. Father, please anoint your words. We've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 1? Look, notice what it says. Sing, O barren. I'm going to stop you in between, but it says, sing, O barren. Now, when you hear the word barren, what do you think about? No fruit. When a woman was barren, that meant that she had no children. So the Bible says, sing. Now, you don't normally sing when things are not good. You normally cry. But the Bible is saying, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into what? Singing and cry aloud. Thou that didst travail with child. Uh, 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 for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. In other words, he was looking at his people and he's speaking in type and any type. That the people of God were supposed to be bearing fruit at the fruit after fruit. The Gentiles converted into her. But because of their being in the wrong relationship with God, they were desolate. The children, the people of God were scattered from the original place. The land of Jerusalem lay barren and Gentiles were not converted into God. But the Bible says through the prophet Isaiah, though judgment has come upon you, do you know that God has a glorious possibility, a glorious future, if we'll be willing to follow God's directions. And then he goes on to say, we can sing, we can cry aloud, a loud cry can go forth. Why? For more, I said, are the children of Jesus than the children of the married wife. Verse 2, what shall we do now? Enlarge the place of thy... Now, in the people of God, they do it in tents because we were pilgrims passing through. Now, if you're getting ready to get a larger tent, that suggests something. Now, here's a person, they live in a studio apartment. Well, they're bachelors. They even sometimes call their apartment a bachelor apartment. Well, what does that mean? That means that that bachelor is not what? He's not married. And if he's not married in, in, in the natural or God-given plan, he shouldn't be bearing any fruit. Amen. 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 He shouldn't be bearing any fruit if he's single. And so, but then the Bible teaches us that if he gets married, then he may change from a bachelor apartment. He might now get ready to move into what? A house that is larger. Instead of it just being a studio now, it has maybe a one room if he's having a small family. Or maybe a two room or a three room. Or depending on whatever the size of the family that they prayed about and follow uh, God's plan. You know, in the book of Adventist Home, there's a chapter called The Size of the Family. You know that we shouldn't just increase the size of our family just by increasing it. We should pray before we do anything. Lord, is this your will? Lord, how many? How much? What should we do? Because if God gives us children, he entrusts us to raise those children according to his will. And do you know that most people are not fit to raise so many children? You know that naturally, God doesn't, naturally, what is the normal order of how many children that, that a, child, a person has when they're married, uh, when they're born, when the child is born, excuse me, when the baby is born? What is normally the general amount that a, a mother has? I said two. I said, brother, I don't know. What they <laughs> <coughs> but one. Now, there are times when you may get twins or triplets. There are some times when you even have, what's that one? The, the eight, the ak, ak, uh, you know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> there are times when, when they have even more. I, I believe that the, one of the largest was 20-something at one time. Not artificial insemination, at one time. And can you imagine uh, the person to raise such a family? Not only would they need to be financially secure. I mean, you have 20 children, sister. What? Every meal. You need a store. You need a, a, a store for every meal. And so the, the Bible is telling us that, that in raising children, normally, you normally get a little bit at a time, one at a time, so that there can be development. Happy Sabbath, come right on in. Now, do you know that is not, in winning souls, it should be very similar. Do you know that it would take a special church to bring in 10 souls at one time? And you say, what do you mean, 10 souls? Well, I know of baptisms where they have hundreds. Most of the times, those people don't remain. And if they do remain, the condition of those that remain are in a retarded condition. You understand what I'm talking about? Everything is not functioning properly. Normally, God does it little by little so that when there's growth, there can be development and you can take care of the child that is born. God is getting ready to cause Richlands to flow into this church, this community to flow into this church. He's getting ready to make this church a beacon, a light into the entire world. But before he can do that, he must do something with us. And so the Bible says we are to get ready. You know, they, they have a, a mindset of the woman when she's getting ready to have a child and she does something called nesting. She does something called what? Nesting. What's she doing? She's getting ready. Let me tell you something here at Rich Lads. Your mind needs to be nesting. Your mind needs to be in a nesting position. In other words, we should be preparing for the increase. Now, how do we do that? Verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy courts and strengthen thy stakes. Now, to anyone who used to live in tents or anyone who has ever been in tents camping, that type of terminology makes a little more sense. The curtains enlarge, the stakes drive deeper. Do you know that the bigger the tent, the larger the stake? If you have this little, little, you know, little, little, little tent for the little child, the stake, you might have a little bit and the wind blow, it just kind of goes over the tent. But the larger the tent goes up, you know, the stakes have to get what? Deeper. Why? Because it needs more support now. That wind, that, 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 that natural wind, the larger it gets, can affect it more so to keep it stable. And that tent, Needs deeper stakes. So that means then if we're getting ready to enlarge, that means that we have to understand the truth deeper. If we're getting ready to enlarge, that means that the truth must go deeper into our heart. It must go deeper into our home. It means that, 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 that as we begin to enlarge, we're to prepare now for a greater system of organization. So that we're preparing to organize even more fully in this church. To organize this in a way that we can handle the growth and the development. Any time that God gets ready to advance a people, he always organizes them so that they can move forward like a company of soldiers. That means that if we're nesting, we want a deeper experience personally. We want a better experience as a family. We want to develop more organization as a church so that we can be prepared to bring in the influx of souls. And then when they come in, it's not a revolving door. They don't come in and go out. They don't come in and get sickly and retarded. But they come in and they grow and develop and move on to perfection. But in order for that to happen to others, that must first begin happening to us. Does that make sense? It says in verse 3, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand. Someone says, what's on the right side of the street? Well, we're going to break forth on that side. Then it says, on and on the left. And thy seed shall inherit the what? Gentiles. And make the desolate cities to be what? Inhabited. So these places that have been uh, pews that have been uninhabited, uh, something is getting ready to habit, uh, happen uh, to make them inhabited. And so now, brother says, you remember the, uh, this picture? Remember this picture? What is the picture of an empty building, an empty church? But God is getting ready to do something to make the church feel to capacity. But in order, and people running from every direction inside the church, trying to get in. Right here, we're going to see with our own eyes, God do this, it provided that we're faithful. I want to be faithful. What do you say? Now, we found, and this is quick review, we found that there are two great lessons. How many great lessons? Yes. At least that we are, have identified. That if we're going to enlarge and develop, that needs to take place. What's the first? Take root. That's right. That's right. What's the first? Take root. 
Take root. What terminology is being used here? Take root. What terminology? That's the agriculture terminology. That's the plant terminology. In fact, go to 2 Kings 19. What book did I say? We're going to 2 Kings 19. See, God is trying to get us ready to do something. God has not made us so that we can just sit here in a church and come to church and week by week do nothing. God wants us, number one, in the church to grow closer to him, to better understand his plan of life so that it improves our condition of living. And then God wants to organize us for service so that we can reach out to the community around us and improve the community in which we belong. We should enrich the community in which we are part of. Second Kings. Uh, my sister, my, my, my young friend. Now you can you know how to turn the Bible too, so you can you can turn that Bible as long with with your mommy. Praise the Lord. Second Kings nineteen. Look what the Bible says in Second Kings nineteen. It's always good to get help. It's good to get help, but by God's grace, you're going to work along with it. All right. Second Kings nineteen. What does the Bible say in Second Kings chapter nineteen? And look what it says in verse thirty one. Second Kings nineteen verse thirty one. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? It says, "For out of Jerusalem, that is the remnant church, shall go forth a what." remnant and they that escape out of mount zion it says the zeal of the lord of hosts shall what so what we're getting ready to read is not going to be the product of our doing we're not going to see richland's uh field to capacity because we're so intelligent or that we have so much ability or we some great teachers of ourselves that's not what's going to do it not by might nor by power but by thy spirit said the lord of hosts but what's going to happen to allow god to send his power and his wisdom through us Verse 30, it tells us what God is going to do. Verse 30 says, and the remnant that is escaped, where? We're in 2 Kings 19, verse 30. And the remnant that is escaped of what? Of the house of Judah shall yet again, talk to me somebody, take root downward and shall bear fruit, talk to me, upward. We're not going to take fruit downward and then bear fruit downward. Now, this is, this is true agriculturally. I, you know that the Bible is the greatest agricultural book. This is talking about how to grow fruit trees, but that's a whole other study. So this is telling us we're to take root downward. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that we're to go deeper in our experience, but as we take root down, downward, something begins to happen. Something begins to happen to go upward, to lift up the church, to raise up a standard. Jenna, stay with me. I'm doing good. Very good. To take root downward, but we're to do what? Bear what? Talk to me, somebody. Fruit. We're to bear fruit. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we begin to start bearing fruit, that is production. You know that God right now wants to produce fruit in the city of Richlands. He wants souls that can be won to his kingdom. He wants birth. He wants fruit. He wants someone to be born again. And you know, this is the responsibility of the church itself. Empowered by the gift of God. So the first thing that God wants to do is to take what? Now, question, if we're going to take root, what does that suggest is going to have to happen to the members of a church locally that take root? What does that suggest has to happen? Talk to me. A study, yes. But we, 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 we talk, see, I'm not just generally talking, we, we spoke on particular principles about taking root. Uh, my brother in the back, yes. They have to be planted somewhere and, and that puts them in a place. Am I right? If I take a plant, Tell me a favorite type of plant. Which one of your favorite type of plant? What's your favorite plant, Olivia? What's your, uh, what was your favorite plant? You're not sure what your favorite plant is? Tell me, tell, what is your favorite plant? Uh, my brother, what's your favorite plant? You, man. <laughs> so he, he, he trying to earn some... some, some. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite fruit? What's, what's a plant you like, huh? Orange. All right, that's a good tree. Now, Let's say that I, I, I'm planting an orange orchard and I take that orange plant and I plant it in the ground here in this place right here. And then tomorrow or next week, it's over here. I say something's wrong with that plant. Next week, if I uproot that plant and put it somewhere else and the next week I put it somewhere else and next week I put it somewhere else. What's going to happen eventually to the root of that plant It's going to get sickly and die. What happens if a, if a, in a family, a church family, if the members of the church don't take root to a local church? If they're just visiting church after church, hopping from church to church, it has become fashionable to become church hoppers. I would want to clear the church of church hoppers and keep in the church those who are going to take what? Now, does it mean that a church hopper is an evil, demonic person? Is that what we're talking about? 
We're talking about growing the church. That's what, that's what we're talking about right now. In growing the church, a church hopper is an enemy of growth. He's an enemy of growth. Not that he's an enemy. I'm talking about he's an enemy to the growth of the church. Because if we're depending on a plant that's to take root, but that plant keeps moving and moving and moving, it will never take what? So then that means in your mind, what do you have to set up in your mind? If you're going to be a part of the church that grows, what must you settle in your mind? I want to take root. Now, it doesn't mean you have to take root here. You know that God may put a person to another church and let them take root there and another church and take root there in the Seventh Adventist church. But we must pray first, Lord, where have you called me? Because God has a place for each of us in his eternal plan. And so my brothers and sisters, we're to pray, Lord, where would you have me to be? I never forget when we came to Virginia, we saw several churches. And we went to another church one time. And as we went there, the person says, oh, you need to come to this church. But God had showed us when we, the first day we came through these doors that this was the church, you were to take root. And so even though they were nice and kind and they asked us to come back, we said, we're not coming back like that. We may visit every now and then. But God showed us here to take root. Some people are already here. Good church members are already here taking root. But you must make it up in your mind if God has brought you here, not a man, not someone else, but you pray to God, Lord, where would you have me? And the moment you know where God would have you as a leader of yourself and of your home, then your goal is to take root in that place and to help your family to take root in that place. And no matter how many other people go here and yonder, do you know that if everybody else left, I and our family, by God's grace, would remain? Because God has called us here. Those who were here before, you, God called you here. And there are others. You must make it up in your mind first, has God called you? And if God has brought you here, then it's time to take root and to develop downward and then fruit will start being prepared. And so by God's grace, we're focusing on that point. Amen? Amen. Now, we found out that not only does the church need to take root, but we found out a second thing, if we're going to grow, that has to take place. If we're going to go spiritually, if we're going to grow uh, uh, with more fruit from the community, a second thing must take place. Does anybody remember what must take place? <laughs> <laughs> so I say, well, you listen five times. You know? <laughs> now, listen to what this is. Now, I'm going to say it in a different way. I'm going to, I, sometimes we st stable things and don't put the handle on it because we're just going in general. But I'm putting numbers on it so it defines what we're talking about. Number two, one of the things that must happen, we must start teaching. We must start doing what? Teaching. We must become a teaching church. If we start taking root, then the church must turn and develop into a teaching church. Do you know that God will never grow a church that's not teaching? Why would he? What would be the purpose? If a church is not teaching, why would God bring souls into a church that is teaching nothing? What sense would it make? And so my brothers and sisters, when we begin to take root, God is trying to make us teachers. And when we become teachers, we start what? Teaching. Teaching. And when you, we begin to start teaching, then God is able to start bringing souls. And after soul, and after soul, and they can be benefited. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we start teaching, what message should we start teaching? The wine of Babylon? What every other evangelical church is teaching? Why, we don't need another church to do that. When we start teaching, what is it that God wants us to start teaching? Talk to me, somebody. The everlasting gospel, the threefold message of Revelation 14. The three angels message. The greatest wealth of truth ever given to mortals that has cut us out from the core of the world. That has separated us from the denominations. That has brought us into a sacred nearness to God himself. Am I right? Now my brothers and sisters, that message is what's to go to the entire world. But we found out that the beginning of that message, what is the first lesson that is to be taught in that everlasting gospel? What's the first lesson? Fear God. Fear God. That means we're telling everybody, be afraid of God and run from him. Is that what we're saying? What, is, what do we mean by the fear of God? Talk to me. We're talking about reverence. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we're going to teach reverence in biblical teaching, we must first what? We ourselves must be practicing reverence. And so that means that if the church is going to grow, not only must we begin to take root, but we must begin to pay more strict attention to fearing God. We must begin to pay more strict attention to reverencing God in his house. Now, someone says, strict, oh, no, there's that word. You know that the devil is tricky. He has made good, bad, and bad, good. You know, in a generation, you have someone say, man, that was bad. You know what they mean? That was good. <laughs> so, now, my brother and sister, the devil has been successful in changing worlds or words around. And today, when you hear the word strict, 
You know what people think? Yeah, I have a good parents, but they're strict sometimes. You know what that's suggesting? That strict is bad. There's nothing wrong with strict. Why, right? strict is a good word. And the only thing that could take away the beauty out of strictness is there's a lack of love. But when I have love and I am strict, all it means is that you're going to be right at where you should be. Strict just means you do things exactly the way it says do it. How is that bad? To do things exactly the way you're supposed to do it. When you're loose, that means you let anything happen. When you let anything happen, that can never be good. <laughs> so now my brothers and sisters, we've got to pay more strict attention to reverence. Now, we gave a reading last week. We suggested a reading. Does anybody remember what the suggested reading was? Yes. Where, what was it? Testimony. Volume 5 of the Testimonies of the Church. That's right. And what was the name of that chapter? Behavior in the House of God. I wonder if anybody read it. I wonder if you read it. I, we read that chapter this week. I'm going to tell you something. It's like I never read it. I've read that chapter over and over again. Those who have read the chapter, was it a serious chapter? Yes. Do we begin to start saying, wait a minute now, we're not necessarily doing all of that. And do you know that I read, and we're going to see before it's over with, I read where the prophet says that if we practice reverence in God's house, that the teaching of his word would have greater effect upon our hearts. That God and holy angels can fill the place and then without us even having to try to struggle to make people believe, the Holy Spirit will be there to convict and to convert the soul. You know why we're having such a hard time making some, uh, leading someone to conversion? is because we are trying to do it absence of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know the disciples? They preached messages before the day of Pentecost. But thousands were not converted in a day. You know why thousands were not converted in a day? Because they did not have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. But do you know that the same sermon, the same, the exact same sermon, with the power of the Holy Spirit, converted thousands in one day? Do you know that God can do that here? Do you know that just what's in this room? I'm not talking about others visiting or not visiting. Just what's in this room right now, we could reach the entire community in one week if we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, normally God protracts time for development and for character, but I'm talking about what is it he's able to do. You understand what I'm saying? He's able to do more than we could ever imagine or think. And I'm going to tell you something. We don't have much time. Do you think we have a lot of time? On everyone's mind right now, something is going on. Something is going on. Congress has less than three days to avoid a government shutdown. And someone said three days, but, but, but that wasn't yesterday. This, this is written Wednesday. Has less than three days to shut a government over. Does anybody know when the limit of the uh, government shutdown comes? Anybody know when the limit comes? That's right. October 1st is the deadline. And laws are passed. Interesting. Interesting. Laws are passed at midnight. Isn't that interesting? Now, when you read Great Controversy and you read the Bible, you'll know why that's important. In Exodus, the Exodus happened at midnight. You, you see when the, that destroying angel came. You'll notice, brothers and sisters, when you read a uh, great controversy said in a time of trouble, when the laws are passed and you get ready to see a death decree, it's at midnight something takes place. Laws, legal laws passed at midnight. That's when limits legally happen. Now, do you know that at midnight tonight, the deadline would have been reached for the government shutdown? Now, on Friday, they say, well, we're going to make it work. It's not the end. Now, they don't know it is the end, but they, they say it's not the end, but they, they, we're at the end of time. Uh, but, but, but they don't understand. Say so Congress is less than three days to avoid government shutdown. Now, what would happen if the government shut down? What would happen? People stop getting paid. Then there's some people going furlough, unwanted furlough. You know. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, this is going to get worse and worse. Now, now, government shutdowns have happened before. Uh, one of the you know, so it's not like it's never have happened, but they're they're done for a reason. Something happens. Now, what is one of the main things going on? Let me pass this. It says, what is the U.S. government shutdown and who will be affected? Uh, the, it is broken down the wide reaching effects of a federal government shutdown on October what? Well, that's a long way away. We don't have to worry about that. That's tomorrow. How many workers will be affected? During the last shutdown, about 800,000 workers were furloughed. It says this time around, the ripple effect may extend even further, resulting in an even larger number of furloughed workers. This includes workers across federal government agencies, including departments of... Now, that's not, you, don't want, you don't want a Department of Defense not to be on, on charge. 
as well as members of the U.S. military. All of this will prove disruptive to, of our national security. John Hubert, an airport security officer in Florida who has worked at the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, for 21 years, said federal workers are continuously put on the what? What does he mean to put on the chopping block? What does he mean? That when something goes wrong, they're the first ones who normally experience this. It's ridiculous, he said. We should not put, be put in this position to win in every single year. You know that we were in this position a few months ago when the Speaker of the House was getting ready to be elected, uh, uh, McCarthy, that was also in the, in the verge of another government shutdown. We're there again. The last major one happened uh, in 2013. Then in 1996. You'll find uh, throughout, but every time something very prophetic was happening when it took place. That's because the federal contingency in supporting normal WT operations will likely run out in matters of days, pushing states to rely on their own money or what? In other words, government funding. One, one government program is the ability to get food stamps. Now, who normally needs food stamps? The wealthy? Now, you'll notice that the government programs, a lot of them affect the poor masses of people. Now, this is very interesting because we're talking about what means starvation for the poor classes that will result in a civil war. Now, it says impacted families are going to be going to what? Food pantries. Now, I wonder if we should have a food pantry somewhere. It says, said this man, these are people who need the help. There are moms. These are moms. These are what? Amen. So this is a real problem. Now, what's going to really happen as, as government programs shit now? Things happen. Now, now get, don't get me wrong. I'm not really telling you that what's getting ready to happen now is this government shut down, all this program stop. Normally, a government shutdown may happen five days, 10 days, 21 days, where you don't see the full impact of this. What I'm telling you is this is something political in its nature that is going to lead to the development of the structure, destruction of masses. Now, this said, this says, it's ridiculous. We should, be put, uh, we should not be put in this position every single year. Then use as a what? Bargaining chip to get. So really, what's happening in the government now, they see something fearful that can result, and they want leaders and the masses to get alarmed so that it can push persons to make decisions that they may not normally make in any other way. And if they don't make the decision, they let the problem get worse. But if they make the decision, then the problem appears to evaporate and disappear. It's a bargaining tactic. I remember one time we was getting ready to uh, 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 buy a car uh, for the family. And I told my uh, family that we was going to get ready to buy the car for. We said, we only want a lot, certain amount of money to do this. And they needed it. And we said, all right. So we found a place and we went into the person's place and they're getting ready to sell it. And I walked into the house and we walked in and they said, we are selling the, the car for this amount of money. But we looked and we saw a little difference and we said, well, no. And there was a lot of money. We're going, we're going to buy it. Let's say the car's going to, be, going to be bought for, let's just say, $3,500. But we look at it and we say, you know what? That really looks like a $2,500 deal. We're not going to pay $3,500. So I tell the family before we walk in because I knew the member of the family might get a little bit agitated. You know, sometimes people don't pay it, play it calm and collect it. You oh, we need the car. You know, <laughs> you, had to, you, had to tell, you had to tell the family, be calm, be collected. So we had a, we had a brief family meeting, you know. <laughs> Then we went to the house and we sat down. And the man talks to the car, shows the car and so forth. And we say, you know what? We're not going to be able to give you 3500 But what we will do is give you 2500 in cash. And took out the envelope. The man, ah, this is a good car. I don't, can't do it. I don't know if I can do it. I talked to the family and I said, all right. Well, so, you know what? We, we're not trying to steal anything from you. We just believe this is a fair offer. If it's not a fair offer, we understand. And we got up. No. Family member sitting up. You know, <laughs> get, get, get up, you know. Yeah, give him a little ear. Yeah, give him a little, you know. And we get out. And we get ready to make, make the leave. We are almost at the door. And sweat drops before forming the beads of the people. And right as we, as we go to the door, I'm, not, I'm serious about this thing. You talk to my family. You talk to my family. We, if we get up and make a move, we gone. We gone. We open up the door. Oh, oh, oh sir, 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 sir. <laughs> we, could probably do it for, we could probably do it for that amount. I said, well, thank you, sir. You know? <laughs> and we were able to do business, you see. But now, my brothers and sisters, it's a bargaining that is being happening with this. Now, do you know what's going on right now? What, what do you think is one of the things on the table of why that the government cannot pass this bill uh, to be passed? What do you think is one of the things on the table? 
Ukraine finds itself at the center of the U.S. government shutdown. The looming federal shutdown is being felt in Kiev as the argument over whether to support Ukraine has heightened concerns already of next year's U.S. presidential election. <clears throat> so you have to understand, you've got to understand what's really happening. You can't just look at the surface and see what's happening. You've got to understand Bible and prophecy and history. So what's happening now, Ukraine's at the center of what's going on. And the Democrats have a position and the Republicans have a position. They're two different positions. And so the uh, president has already said that if he goes forward, he's going to offer more money to Ukraine. And I'm not even saying if it's right or wrong. I'm just dealing with what's actually happened. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, do you know how much money that has already been funneled from America to Ukraine? Anybody know the numbers? Let me write down some numbers on the board. I'm going to put plus. And when I say plus, you know what that means? More. Over $70 billion. Yes. <laughs> to be exact, they say 74. But over 70 billion dollars have funneled out of the hands of America into the hands of Ukraine. And so you say, well, that, that's what the masses. <laughs> and the Republicans, they don't like that because they're saying now America needs money, too. <laughs> and like, now that's 74 billion, brother, not million, billion. So then. Now, but you have to understand there's a reason why the Democrats are willing to give 74 billion dollars. See. When, when we jump on sides, we don't really understand what's happening from a geopolitical pos uh, position. Geographical and political. There's something going on. Now, you've got to understand, Ukraine is also a position of power for the U.S. They hold very key resources, and it is at a particular position politically that can either increase the power of America or increase the power of Russia who is contending for power to regain control and be up above America. So the world has to be, uh, 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 government has to try to move intelligently in a political uh, realm. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, my brothers and sisters, so we have over 70 billion uh, being handed over. And so they're saying, no, 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 we're not going to sign no more bills. And the bill that's trying to put, be put forth is one that will try to eliminate this. And we can't sign it unless we start changing how we use the budget of our money. And they can't get together on this. And so they say, well, if we let people suffer, somebody will make a decision quicker. You understand what I'm telling you? Because they will either get the support of the masses or they won't get the support of the masses. And that's the idea of election. And we're moving toward an election year right now. Do you know that this type of movement always takes place as we get ready to move toward an election year? Do you better understand something? We're headed toward trouble right now. But do you know that this government shutdown is the least of our worries. What's happening right now? Now, here's a, a, a speaker that spoke for the IMF. Anybody know what the IMF is? The International Monetary Funds, World Powerful Organization. She spoke there, the IMF. And look at what her speech. What's her speech? She's not speaking good days and wonderful days. Blue sunshines and blue beaches. That's not what she's speaking about. Facing what? Crisis. crisis upon crisis. How the world can respond. Now, her title is facing crisis upon crisis. What does that tell us that she recognizes that the world is in? And then what's to get ready to come? And what's behind that? Another crisis. You understand what I'm telling you? Now look what it, look what, this is the beginning of her speech. Thank you. It is a great honor for the IMF to partner uh, with the Carnegie Endowment. All these are, um, our institutions are committed to share peace and prosperity. A especially vital goal at this critical moment of the world we live in. To put it simply, we are facing a crisis on top of a crisis. All you have to do is let her talk at a church and you will think she was a preacher of the third angel's message. All we do is face crisis upon crisis. Now, my brother says, what do you think that means? What do you think she's saying? Now, that, this is the beginning of her speech. She didn't get into five minutes of her speech. What is she saying? Facing crisis upon crisis. Talk to me, somebody. What is she saying? It's going to be worse and worse, and it's going to go from bad to worse, and from worse to worse, sir. <laughs> Someone said, I didn't know that was a word. We're going to really see words made in dictionaries because the problems will get so bad. First, the pandemic. Now, what if she began the crises? Where did she begin it? The beginning of the end. First, the pandemic, 
it turned our lives and economies upside down and it's not over. Somebody says it's over. It's not over. The continued spread of the virus could give us rise to even more contagious or worse, more lethal variants, prompting further disruptions and further divergence between rich and poor countries. Second, the war. What war? Russia's invasion of what? Ukraine, devastating uh, for the Ukrainian economy and ours, by the way, is the sending shockwaves throughout the globe. Above all is this human tragedy, the suffering of ordinary men, women, and children in Ukraine. Over 11 million displaced people. Our hearts go out to them. The economic consequences from the war spread what? And far. To neighbors and beyond, hitting hardest the world's most vulnerable people. Talking about the poor masses. And for the first time in many years, inflation has become a clear and present, uh, 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 talking about damaging countries around the world. This is a massive what? Set back for the global recovery. In economic terms, growth is down. Inflation is up. What does it mean? It means, in human terms, people's incomes are yeah. down and hardship is up and going up. Now, my brothers and sisters, just words, she, just named, she just named two. We can go down and listen and say, crisis, 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 crisis. The handwriting is, guess what? Oh. On the wall. Now, my brothers and sisters, God is trying to tell us that he wanted his church to be in a position now, with problems, what happens? Whenever there's a problem, what do we start looking for? If there was no problem, you would never look for a solution. And they're going around the world looking for solutions, but guess what? America has put together a solution to all this problem. What is the solution that America has put together? Talk to me, somebody. What is the solution America put together? Project 2025. Project 2025. It's been put the solution. It says... The actions of liberal politicians in Washington have created a desperate need. I'm talking about the $74 billion. And a unique opportunity for conservatives to start undoing the damage that, left, that the left has wrought and build a better country for all Americans in 2025. Building now for a conservative victory through policy, personnel, and training. So what this project is saying is the actions of the liberal politicians in Washington have created a desperate what? In other words, what are they saying has produced the problem? They're saying that the liberal left has produced a problem in America that we need to change the government in order to stop it. It says it is not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we're going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, we need both a what? Governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry out this agenda in a hundred years. On day one of the next conservative administration. When are they planning for that? 2025. This is the goal of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. For the project will build on four pillars that will collectively pave the way for an conserv uh, effective conservative administration, a policy agenda, personnel training, and a 180-day playbook. That's half a year. They're saying in six months' time, they want the country to look different. Now, my brothers and sisters, in the midst of this, what have they said? I don't have time to look at it today because that's not our agenda today. We're not studying 2025, Project 2025. But my brothers and sisters, the agenda is they want to take back our what? Government. Beginning on January what? 2025. And take back the government in 180 days, a change scene. Now, my brothers and sisters, inside of the planning, they speak of the need of a legislation for Sabbath. We've got to open up in our mind. And say, Lord, the handwriting is here, but we're not ready. And do you know that God intended the church by this time to have already taken what? Root. So that we can begin to start teaching and bearing fruit. Does that tell us that we need to start some transition right now? Yes or no? So we want to stop right here and pray. And ask God to get us in position so that we can become a teaching church. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is evident that the handwriting is on the wall. It is evident that we don't have much time. But it is also evident that you want your church to shine in the midst of this darkness. That you want us to be a light in the midst of this saddening problems, the salt of the earth. And the salt is what is to preserve. We're to preserve the nation. To understand the fear of God and the reverence for God and the teaching of God so that we can become what you would have us to be. And we know that the entire nation won't accept but you will have a people inside this nation, in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that will experience the blessings that come from a relationship of Jesus and following your commands 
and your precepts. We pray, Lord, that as we study today, that you would help us to get ready, that you'll prepare us as a church to take root, to become a teaching church, and to learn the importance of reverence in your house. Lord, as we spend these last 10 minutes putting this together before our groups come to the scene, we pray that you would help us to see that the purpose of this exercise is to better prepare us to be a teaching church to help in solving the problems that exist in this world so that we can finish the work before it is too late. Abide with us now, we pray. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Be with the teams that we'll present today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take 10 minutes to do an introduction here for the class. And then by God's grace, we're going to call up our first team. Is our first team in position. Praise the Lord. All right, so we'll get ready to do that. Let's take our Bibles quickly. And let's go to the book of Matthew 28. Now, I don't want us to forget this. What we're saying now, very important, as foundational to each one of us to understand and to help our families to understand. Let's go to Matthew 28. If ever there was a time in the history of the world when seven day Adventists were to arise and shine, the time is now. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that God intended in this last hour that in the midst of the problems worsening, that God would have a people that could solve the problems that exist. But instead of a church becoming more uh, 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 able to grab the attention of the masses, we have a church today that has lost its position of significance in the world. We've lost our position to affect and, 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 and move upon the world and impress the world. We have lost uh, our position of being relevant to the world, so much so that we're considered non-essential. That when an epidemic or a pandemic takes place, they can let the church sit, sit down because they believe that this church is a non-essential part of society. Now, how can you open up Lowe's and open up Walmart and open up Kroger's and open up Home Depot? How can you open up these stores as essential and close the church as non-essential? Well, there's a reason. Because as a church, we have stopped functioning as God has designed. We have stopped doing the very part and parcel and work that God has called us to. And we have degenerated into a condition that God has never called his church to be in. What has happened? We become a church of preliminaries. We become a church of committees. We will have a committee about a committee. And a committee of solving a problem, but the committee never does anything. And so, my brothers and sisters, that doesn't solve problems. We have become a church of entertainers. Where our great goal is to entertain society, but God has never called his church to become a church of entertainers. I've read of no command in the Bible. I have read of no commission, no gospel commission that says that the church is to entertain the nations. Entertaining them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why? There's no scripture like that. Nothing in the Bible even suggests such an idea. God has called us to be a church of teachers. How do I know? Matthew 28. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 28. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Let's read that together. Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me where? Where? In heaven and where? In earth. Verse 19. Go ye therefore, because of this power, go ye therefore and entertain all nations. Start committees all over the world. No, 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 no. It says, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Doing what? Verse 20. Teaching them, not whatever we want, not church manuals, but teaching them to observe how many things? All things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until what? <clears throat> in the world. Amen. If the church was doing this in verity, if the church was doing this in truth, if the church was doing this in reality, there would be no building in rich lands that could house the crowds that would come to this church. Why, there would be no building in the state of Virginia. There would be no building in the nation of America Yea, there will be no building in the world that could house the persons that would flow into it. In fact, the Bible says all nations would flow into it. Has this ever been done? Someone says, well, you can't say if it's never been done. Has it ever been done? Yes or no? When did we see the first great demonstration of someone taking on this goal of taking root and start teaching and so was able to impact that there was no building able to hold the teacher that did such a thing? Jesus Christ. Look at Mark. What book did I say? That's Matthew. Go to Mark chapter 2. Go over just a few chapters. 
You remember what we read? Remember what we read about Christ in, in Mark chapter 2? Look what it says. Ministry of Healing 17. The Savior's work was not restricted to any time or place. His compassion knew how much? No limit. Now watch what it says. The inspiration is beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? It says, on so large a scale did he, Jesus, conduct his work. What work? His work of healing and talk to me, somebody. Jesus was that great teacher. That there was some buildings. There was no building in Palestine large enough to receive the multitudes that thronged to him. Why, there would be no stadium that could house it. There would be no place that could take place that, that could be filled in this way. And do you know, brother, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that it's going to come again. In Mark chapter 2, we see here, Mark chapter 2, look what the Bible says in Mark 2. Some say, I don't remember reading Jesus filling up buildings. That was because there was no building that could do it. He had to be on the open air, on the hillsides. Mark chapter 2 verse 1 says, and again, he, sent, he entered the Capernaum after some days. And it was what? It was what? Noise. Noise that he was in the house. Can you imagine? Everybody said, Jesus is in town. Can you imagine coming to a place in town where there's not one sick person because Jesus had been there? Not one person on diabetes. Not one person with high blood pressure. Not one person with an ailment of the eye or the body or the heart or the lungs or the leg. Can you imagine? Not one pro problem that was not solved. Christ was there. The Bible tells us that this is why they flocked to him and why so many follow Jesus. In fact, verse 2 says, And straightway many were gathered together in so much, how much? That there was what? No room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. In other words, they were, you could, they could, they, they were squeezed in. They could barely even get in any more inside. Does God want to do it again? Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out that God wants to do it again. Where in the Bible do we know of a prophecy that tells us in the last days that such a thing will happen again? In the book of Isaiah. Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 2. The Bible says that such a thing will happen again. Isaiah chapter 2. Beginning in verse 2, the Bible speaks at this time. And do you know that this was the book of Isaiah of enlarging our tent, of taking root? This is the same book that Jesus quoted when he started his public ministry. Isaiah chapter 2, let's read that together, verse 2. And when you're there, let me know by saying amen. <clears throat> let's read that together. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass. What is that? Future. Prophecy. It shall come to pass in what days? In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's what? House. That's his church. Shall be established where? Not in the bottom, but where? In the top of the mountain. In other words, going to be exalted. And shall be exalted above the hills. And some people will come in. All nations shall what? Flow into it. This is, remember, remember the picture? We talked about that picture where the people were actually uh, running in. Where the people were running to the church. Remember that picture? Where the people were actually running into the church. And then the Bible says, verse 3, And many people shall what? Not a few, but many shall go and say what? Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will. So why are all these nations flowing? Why are all these nations flowing? Because somebody has begun teaching because they've taken root. And now all the nations are flowing because of the particular teaching that is taking place. Now I want to ask you a question. This is testing you. Pop quiz even before our group comes up. Why is teaching so important? Because today you have a lot of teachers in this world, don't you? But we have a, a lot of problems. So why is it that the teaching is to be such a great benefit to the world when we have so many teachers in the world already. Why? There has to be, where's our microphone, thank you. There has to be a great difference between worldly teaching and biblical teaching. All right, my brother, Brother Desarme, talk to me. In the world, uh, you, can, you can teach and you can be a uh, professor of, with a PhD in business but not have a business. Yes. But in, in, uh, in scripture, we see that he taught only because they did it. Talk to me, my friend. Now, right on the point. Don't even need to adjust that. Right on the point, my friend. In biblical teaching, how many parts of biblical teaching? Three. Three. Give it to me from the last to the beginning. Someone's, oh, you're tricking me? No, 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 no. 
Give it to me from the last week. Oh, I see a hand over here. Talk to me. Wait, 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 put her on the, she needs to get in trouble too. Put her on this. She knew into this thing. Come on now. Teach. Now we, we go for, that's the beginning. You're right, you're right. We'll go from the back to the front. But as you're right, you're right though. Yes. Teach. We're going to go, um, we're gonna go from the, the, back to the uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Go ahead. No, you're right, you're right on point. Okay, what's the, what's the, what's the back? Teach. Very good, very good, my sister. I don't mean to mix you up. That's very good. Teach. Do. Good. Do. No. Talk to me. Yeah. This is biblical teaching. So in biblical teaching, before you ever open up your mouth to be effective in reaching someone else, we must have already been doing it. Experiencing some of the blessings of knowing, blessed are they that, not talk, blessed are they that do. Revelation 22, 14. Now, my brother and sister says, but before we can do, the Bible says, if you know these things, happy if you do. So first, we must begin to go to a school where we can study to know. Once we go to school, we can get some knowing or some knowledge that we can then seek to not tell, but seek to what? Do so that we can turn the knowledge into wisdom. Knowledge is information unpracticed. Wisdom is information put into practice. So that you can be a fool even though you have knowledge. That's why the foolish virgins, they had knowledge, but they did not have the practical experience that that knowledge was to produce. See, a man who has a PhD, but is not putting into practice in the life of others or his own life and solving the problems, he has knowledge but no wisdom. Now, my brothers and sisters, we are to go to school, uh, God's school, to study his word, to study with God, to get knowledge so that we can do it Put it into practice, and then we're in a better position, not only to get the benefit of it, but to start teaching it to others. Does that make sense, yes or no? Yes. Now, what does real teaching do? Now, what is a, te what is a teacher? What is the, how, how can I evaluate a teacher? How can I evaluate a teacher by looking at a, a, a condition? How can I evaluate? How can I evaluate a teacher by looking at a condition? All right, now, now, now let's bring the microphone over, over here, please. Now, Sister Peters, we put you on here now. Come on, talk to us. Talk to us, Sister Peters. The teacher should have a solution. So the teacher should have a what? Talk to me, somebody. The teacher should have a solution. Now, give it to me in the terminology of... I don't know if I want to say that. <laughs> give it to me in a, in a terminology, a physical terminology. I'll say that. Give it to me in a physical terminology. I see a hand over here. A hand over here. Thank you. And physical terminology. Give me, give me a name. Heal. heal, yes. Can I have a problem that needs to be healed in finances? Yes. Can I have a problem that needs to be healed in a social uh, problem? Yes or no? Yes. Can I have an economical something that needs to be healed? See, a government can be healed. This is, this, all of these things, healing, is only talking about that a person is sick or has a disease. And there are political diseases, economic diseases, social diseases, marital diseases. Family diseases, business diseases, diseases in life. And the teacher should be able to heal these different diseases. Now, if the teacher is healing them, providing the solution, what would you call that teacher? Well, you call him a doctor. And that makes sense. Because a doctor should heal. Now, the word doctor means what? Talk to me. Teacher. That's what the word means. So a teacher is simply a doctor. But a doctor is supposed to not just look at disease. A doctor is supposed to be able to do what? Talk to me. Heal the disease. To provide the solution, as my sister said, to the problem. But now I want to ask you a question. What if you have a man that calls himself a doctor, and he goes to a family, and they have a problem, and they follow everything that doctor says, but their problem is not solved. Their economic problem not solved. Their political problem not solved. Their social problem not solved. Now, that's not a doctor. Do you understand? It's a false doctor. It's a physician of no value. Now, my brothers and sisters, God wants to make his church... Teachers that can heal the ills that exist in society. Now, what would happen if what we did in this community was begin to start showing people how to solve their problems that exist today? What would happen to this church? Why, there will be, it will be flooded with persons, even that didn't care about religion. Because everyone has problems. Whether he's an atheist or an Adventist, he has a problem. So now, my brothers and sisters, as we look at this, the doctor, what does that sound like, doctor? Doctrine. What is a doctrine? What is a doctrine? A teaching. All a doctrine is a teaching. And every doctrine of Christ is a solution to a problem of life. Every teaching that God has is some solution. But sometimes we don't know it that way. 
We haven't studied it that way. We don't do it so that we see it that way. And as a result, we can't teach it that way. But the gospel, the everlasting gospel, the three angels messages is a, uh, uh, is a simple solution to the problems of life. That's what it is. And the greatest problem we have is sin. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we're going to start teaching in that way to heal. In conclusion, if we want to start teaching that way to heal. What will we start teaching first? To fear God. Hebrews says, we looked at it last week. Hebrews says, now go to Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 25. Go to Psalms 25. Is there a connection between fearing God and teaching? Is fear talking about afraid? No. What is fear talking about? Talk to me. What is fear talking about? Reverence. Now, how do you know that fear is talking about reverence? How do you know that? How do you know that fear is talking about reverence? Because if we're going to teach that, that's, that's one thing that has to be taught. That fear is talking about reverence. How would I, from the Bible, show that the fear of God is connected in explaining that it is this reverence for God. Well, would I go in the Bible and see that? Uh, yes, but we want to go somewhere else because that you won't see it by itself there. Uh, what Leviticus will tell us, Leviticus will tell us, we'll, we'll talk about reverence this century. What do you say now? Uh, Proverbs will tell us uh, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of something, but it won't tell us that the fear of God is reverence. It won't tell us that. Hebrews 12. Let's go there now. So all, all those texts are connected, but we got to be able to put them in the, and see them in their right connection or else it won't be teaching. See, my brothers and sisters, we'll find out we can't just say that's what it is. We have to look at the Bible. The word actual doctor uh, literally comes from a Latin word that means show, point out. That's what the word actually means. And when a teacher is teaching, they're supposed to be showing and pointing out uh, in their life and with their lips. So now notice what the Bible says in Hebrews 12. What verse? Somebody thought they won't get away with that one. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Let's read that. Hebrews 12 and verse 28. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 12 and verse 28? The Bible says, <clears throat> verse 28, all together, we there? Yes. It says, wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have what? Grace. Now, there are many, many texts. I'm just looking at one because we're going somewhere today. It says, uh, let us have grace whereby we may serve God where? Acceptably. How? With reverence and what? So when we're fearing, when we have godly fear or fearing God, then what is connected with it, what godly fear is dealing with is what? Talk to me somebody. Reverence. So it's not talking about being afraid. It's dealing with reverence for God. Now that becomes very important. Now many texts that bring this out. I'm not going through all those texts right now. The reverence for God. Now how do I know there's a connection between fear of God, reverence, and teaching? Go to Psalms 25. Go to Psalms 25. And notice what the Bible says. Very interesting. Now, we're going to see before it's over. Not today, but in another one of our studies, we're going to see that if we don't practice reverence, we can never stop sinning. That reverence is necessary to give glory to God. That's why it says fear God and then give glory to him. We'll never be able to stop sinning until this takes place. Never can that happen until this takes place. All right, let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 25. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Psalms 25. I'm running. I'm running. Psalms 25. Look what the Bible says in Psalms 25. And I want to see if you see the connection. I'm not going to immediately tell you what the connection is. But in Psalms 25, look what the Bible says in verse 12. Let's read verse 12. We'll read this together. It's so good. I got to read it with you. Psalms 25 verse 12. Let's read that. Are you there? Amen. Yeah. Let's read that together. The Bible says, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Did you get that? Yes. Now, now I, I saw Sister Haywood got that. She said, wow. That's right, Sister Haywood. That's what I said, too. <laughs> now, that, the, the expression of wow is actually ah. Yes. Awesome. That's what reverence actually is. When we adore him so much, ah, Lord, I never saw you. are so great, Lord. We give him the respect that, is deserved, that he deserves. Now, what do we see in that verse? What does that show us? Why is that important? Talk to me. Is there a relationship between fear of God, reverence, and teaching? Yes or no? Yes. Talk to me. What is the relationship? God will what? God will what? Teach. That fear him or reverence him. Question then, what if I don't reverence God? Then God can't teach me. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. It's those who reverence God that God can teach us. 
And so, my brothers and sisters, do you see why? That if we're getting ready to teach the world, the world cannot learn anything unless they first learn to reverence God. And we can't teach anything unless we learn to reverence God. And so what has to happen to a church if it's going to become a teaching church? It must become a reverential church. Does that make sense now? We will never become a church of teachers as long as we and our children do not learn to practice reverence. Does God condemn our children when they don't practice reverence? No. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Education, not condemnation. If it takes a thousand times, do it a thousand times. Bring back. Educate. Repeat. Repetition. Don't get upset. But with the meekness and love of God, repeat. This is so important. We've got to do this. Do it throughout the week, Sunday, Monday. We're going to talk about it in more depth. That's not our subject for today. We're going to talk about it more in depth. Now, God is trying to get us into study groups. Look what it says, volume 6, uh, page 87. There should be less what? There should be less preaching and more teaching. Inspiration says, in place of so many sermons. Now, this says, there are those who want more definite light than they receive from hearing the... You know that when you hear a sermon, you might even understand it, but you may not be able to teach it. Because you hear in the sermon, it give you a, a, a brief breakdown of it, but it takes more time to teach. It says... There are those who want more definite light than they receive from hearing the sermons. Now, what's wrong with a sermon? Nothing wrong with a sermon. But you know there should be more teaching than sermons? It says, some need a what? Now, what does that tell us? That it takes longer to teach than it does to preach. It says, some need a longer time than others to what? Understand the points presented. If the truth presented could be made a little what? So what is the teaching doing uh, that the preaching is making the truth what? Is making it plain. It says they would see in it, see it, and take what? Hold that almost sounds like something. I'm not, I'm not, that almost sounds like taking root. They take hold of it, and it would be like a what? Nail fastened in a what? It wouldn't leave the moment you left church. I can't remember what that verse was. I can't remember what that quote. I, didn't, I know it meant something. What, what, what was that again? It meant what well, God's want to teach us so it stays with us. So that we can know it, we can practice it, and then we can share it. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what it says. It has been shown me, the prophet, volume 6, 88. It has been shown me. What did the prophet see? As we approach nearer the... Are we there right now? Yes or no? Then we should see what the prophet says she saw. I have seen that in these meetings, there will be less what? So in the meetings we have at the end of time, there should be less preaching and more what? What does that sound like? Talk to me, somebody. BTI. Not preliminaries. It says there will be what? Wait a minute now. There will be what? Talk to me, somebody. Let me, let me black that out so I can talk to you a little more. <laughs> there will be little groups. What have we begun to set up? Talk to me, somebody. Little, little, little groups. groups. See, everything we follow should be inspiration. There will be little groups all over the ground with their Bibles in their hands. That's not like their BTI. And different ones leading out in a free conversational study of the Scripture. Not this rope. I say something, do, 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 do. no one else can say anything, but we talk back and forth. Well, I can ask you a question, you can give me an answer. We're conversating. I ask you what this means, you tell me what that means. We study this, and, and point by point by point. This was the method that Christ taught his disciples. Now, that means if we're not following this method, we're not going under his teaching. This is the method that Christ taught his disciples, and when it's followed, no building in Palestine. Now, you know the greatest thing we want to fill our church with? Not people. You know, we can fill the church even if there was nobody there. The Bible says that Christ feels all and all. You are complete in Christ. Now, I think I better tell us that. We've been talking about this being filled, but I purposely have not told us what the field really is. The feeling is not packing Richlands with people. You know, you could have a church full of people and no one else can come in and the church still be empty. The house could still be desolate. And we could have three people at this church. And it be filled to capacity. The answer is that we want to fill it with the Holy Spirit. That's what we really mean. That thine house may be filled. Now if we have filled the Holy Spirit. It's going to reach multitudes with God's message. But never equate people. Multitudes of people. With what it really means to be filled. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Today our church is full right now. I'm not looking, you know, I'm not looking saying there's going to come a day when the church is. I'm not looking for that. Already it's white. Already I see fulfillment. And all God is telling us, if we'll do the three things. Study. Know. Do. Not only will he heal us and our family, 
but it will heal the entire world. Amen. We can become a group of teachers. So God is trying to get us ready for teaching. Does that make sense? Amen. All right. We found out that there's going to be uh, Bible, little, uh, little groups, little groups all over the ground with their what? Bible. Bibles in their hand. So it's good to see groups with their Bibles in their hand and different ones leading out in a free what type of study? Conversational study of the scriptures. This was the method that Christ himself used. Am I right? So we saw that. Uh, now, we're, we're going to close here. Child guidance, 543. It says, parents, it is your duty to have your children in what? Perfect judgment. We're talking about reverence in, in conclusion. Because we're going to start teaching more. What has to be done is we must be introduced to more reverence. Am I right? It says, child guidance, 543. Having all their passions and evil temper subdued. And if children are taken to meeting... They should be made to know and understand what? Where they are. So a child shouldn't come to meeting. You know, so you just throw toys on the ground. They think they're at a playground. The child should know where they are. Where are they? They're in God's house. We're to hear God speak to us. It says that they are not a, at home, but where God what? Meets with his people. And they should be kept quiet and free from? Free from what? All play. And God will turn his face where? Towards you to meet with you and bless you. So what does that happen? Now, what if a minister then allows the child to play in church? What would happen to God's face? It actually turns away from us. And then what happens? God won't be able to what? Meet with you and he won't be able to what? So what can keep back God's blessings on a church? If we're not training the home and those inside the home to come to church and know where we are. If we're allowed to do what at church? If we're allowed to do what at church? Play. Then God has to turn and his blessings can't be there. Now, the ignorance, God does what? He winks. But he cannot bless us the way he wants to bless us. So then the minister has to start educating that we got to raise the standard what? Higher. And by God's grace, that's what we're doing in this church because God wants us to enlarge, expand, deepen the stakes. That means that we need more holiness for this blessing. In fact, it goes on. Child guidance 543. If order is observed, talking about this reverence. If order is observed in the assemblies of the... What is an assembly? What is an assembly? Where we... Gather together. The truth will have better effect upon all that hear it. Now, think about that for a moment. What does effect mean? What is effect? That's the results. So then what happens if reverence is maintained at a church with adults and children? What happens when someone comes in and listens? What does the truth have? Effect. More effect. But what if reverence is not at a church and someone comes to hear? They're distracted by the talking. They're distracted by the playing. They're distracted by the in and out movement. You know, there was a time when you came to church, you don't get up and leave the church so quickly. Do you know that, 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 that there was a time when the, when the parents say, hold it. <laughs> or go to the bathroom in before. You know, that's education. Do you know that we don't have the ability just to go in and out, in and out. You know, when a judge comes into a courtroom, do you know that, that, that there are places you just can't go in and out the way you want to. You know, that, that, when you go into a, a, a prison facility, you, you can't even bring your cell phone in there. God deserves more honor than any judge on this earth. Amen. You know, if you're talking in the courtroom, when the judge is talking, he may, he may even put the gavel down. Boom. What would he say? What would he say? Now, think about it. What would he say? Order in the court. This is part of setting the house in order. This is part of reverence. And so God doesn't want us to do this because we're afraid he's going to burn us in hell. He wants us to do this because we recognize how great he is, Amen. how good he is. How awesome he is. So we say, Lord, you know, some, oh, you just like, oh, I want to be quiet because God is here. You know, sometimes you're so excited. You, you, you're so in awe. Oh, you can't even open your mouth. What did they say? Did you? That was. You know, that, that's that's that awe struck. You understand? That's how it should be when God is in the assembly. A solemnity, which is so much needed, will be what? Encouraged. And there will be power in the truth to do what? Stir up the depths of the soul and a deaf like stupor will not hang upon those who hear. Can you imagine that? When reverence is practiced in a church it will be like the angels of God are there because they will be. You will know that God is there and his truth will have a greater impact. We will know that we're in the presence of the living God. We'll be afraid to even open up our mouths because God is there. And if the spirit of the Lord is present, he can heal us. I don't care what the problem is. And so this is why we, would, we couldn't wait to get to church if we understood this concept. Believers and unbelievers will be affected. It has seemed evident that in some places the ark of God was removed from the church. In other words, it's like the holiness is gone. We, we go to church chewing gum all over the place. 
I mean, I mean, I mean just that, that, that's a careless attitude. Now, if we don't know it, God doesn't condemn us. But do you know that God wants us to recognize when we come into his presence, it should be with order and decorum. We shouldn't just walk in talking all over the place. It should be carefulness. When we come in, we should pray before we even sit down and begin and pray, Lord, you're here. Help my mind to recognize this. We shouldn't have a distraction. We're thinking about work. We're thinking about the house. We're thinking about this. Are we looking at the persons walk by as they come in? Our eyes should be on the teacher. Our eyes should be looking for the Holy Spirit, waiting for God to speak to us because we know God is talking. This is a different atmosphere. It's inspiration says, but the ark of God was removed from the church for the holy commandments have been violated and the strength of Israel has been weakened. You know, there was a time when a person knew who a seven day Adventist was. It was different. But that has been lost today. But you know that God has promised there will be a revival and a reformation. And I want it to begin now with my heart and with our home. What do you say? Amen. Let's close in Deuteronomy 23. Let's close there. In Deuteronomy 23. We want to close in Deuteronomy 23 today. God has blessed us. And I'm telling you something. God has already begun to do something. And you must make them in your mind. Are you going to be planted at this church? Are you going to be planted? Yes or no? Yes. I, don't, I don't matter what anyone else does. They can be all over the place. But for us, God has us here. And we want to grow as God grows. We want to do what God says. We saw what God is doing, preparing this teaching. We see uh, uh, this. Now, Deuteronomy 23. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter. And we want to begin in verse 14. Let's look at Deuteronomy 23 and verse 14. Are you there? Amen? amen. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 14? It says, For the Lord thy God does what? Walketh in the midst of thy camp. Gianna, look at that. In the midst of thy camp. Continue. To, to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies. So why does God want to be with us in the church? Why does God want to be here? So he can, so he can destroy us? God wants to be in our midst so he can deliver us. Then it says, and to give my enemies before. In other words, we can conquer the world if God is with us. And then it says, therefore, because we want God with us, shall thy camp be what? Holy. Now, what happens if it's unholy or irreverent? That, look at what it says. It goes on to say that he see what? No unclean thing in thee and what? Turn. What happens if we're irreverent and unholy? God has to turn. How can he deliver us from our sins and deliver us from the world around us? He cannot. But do you know that if God is with us, there's nothing that can stop us. No enchantment of the devil if God is with us. And so uh, we want to pray this week. If you didn't read Behavior in the House of God, I encourage you to read it this week if you didn't. If you didn't finish it, finish it. You will see everything that God has said and you'll see to us that we need to repent and say, Lord, we didn't understand how holy you are. We don't want to just be all careless. We want now to understand that we want God in our midst. When God is in our midst, he can make us teachers because he's a teacher. And before we start teaching, what happens? We need to start doing. When we leave church, it shouldn't be that we heard a sermon and we only heard it so we can talk about it. You know that God wants us to practice what we hear. Yes. Do you know that we've learned several things, but throughout the week, you know what normally happens? And this is what happens. Here's this thing here. Here's a gap. And here's over here. We know. Here's over here. Do. Most of the times, we know more than we do. Now, do you know that most people are going to be lost? Not, well, I'll say it this way. Anyone that is lost will be lost, not because he doesn't know something. You know, no one will be lost because he doesn't know anything. No one will be lost because he doesn't know something about diet or something about dress or something about health. No one will be lost because of that. My brother and sister, we are lost because we don't have a relationship with Jesus. But there's something that separates us from Jesus. What separates us from Jesus? Sin. That destroys the relationship with Christ. Sin doesn't make us know God. Sin makes us not know God. If we sin, we have never seen him nor known him. Sin destroys the relationship with God. Now, do you know that if I know but don't do, that's called something. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is. So when I know more than what I do, it's destroying my relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? So now, my brothers and sisters, if we learn something, do you know that many people have learned something about a plant-based diet, but still don't practice it? How can we become teachers? How can we develop a relationship with Jesus if we're doing that? Some people know something about music or something about worship or something about health or something about relationships or something about family. It doesn't really matter what it is. God is trying to tell us he gives us information so that we can develop a relationship. This is what he wants. But when we leave church and say that was a good sermon, 
but then we don't go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and start practicing it, all we're doing is heaping up damnation upon ourselves. And God's not interested in that. How many today say this week, Lord, I want to fill this gap. Why well, I don't know and I'm not doing, no matter what the subject is, but I want to fill up that gap so that I'm doing everything that I know. Can God help us to do that? Amen. Now, it's not hard because you don't have to learn that. You know, you know that if I know something, I don't need to take time to relearn that. What God needs to tell me is to teach me how to surrender so that I can have his power to do what I know. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know that this church will grow spiritually? We will grow spiritually if we simply said, Lord, everything that you have taught us. Help me now to do it. If we can go with that conviction today, because I know and the Lord has shared with me and he shared with you, too. He doesn't just tell us this, but I know that we're we're not doing everything we've learned. That's not happening. And God knows this. And we can't pretend that's not going to help us. That's not going to grow the church. That's not going to enlarge the tent. As a minister of God, I'm speaking to myself and all of us. We've got to now say, Lord, what you have said to us. We need your help because we don't want to be like Israel. All that you say we will do, we can't do it. But we can say, Lord, all that you said with your help, we can do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You have to make a decision in your mind. This week cannot be like last week. The things that I learn, the things that I know. Now, Lord, I'm going to get on my knees and wrestle with you that they may be carried out. I made a commitment, a recommitment. I'm telling you, each week, I, I don't care how many times I got to get back up. I'm saying, Lord, we cannot stop. Time is running out. I mean, you see what we're, you, 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 you see the hand, right? I, what more do we have to see, brothers and sisters? God is showing us that there's only a little time left, and he wants us to take it serious. It is a mercy for you and I to be at this little church, to do what we're doing, study what we're studying. And today can be the beginning of a new and deeper experience. What do you say? Amen. Is that your desire today? Yes. You want to go all the way with the Lord and you want to say, Lord, this week, whatever you've shown me, I want your help to start doing it. If there's some things that we're backslidden on, this is the time to stop backsliding this week. Whether it's music or diet or dress, this week, Lord, stop the time. Back. If, I'm, 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 if my eyes see things that shouldn't, this week, we must start. If our pride and selfishness and anger, this week, it's got to stop. Can God help us? Yes. Praise, praise God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we sense your presence right now. And Lord, we don't want to leave the church with an appeal and then, Lord, go back to the same way of life. Today, we want to make a decision, Lord, that we have wandered far from you. But we're coming home today. That today we're going to allow you to do something for us. And no matter what battle we must fight against established habits, against long cherished sins, this week, Lord, there's going to be a battle that we will never give up, but that you will give us strength to overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we will love not our lives until the death. Father, give us that determination that we're going to take root by your grace, that we're going to grow and to bear fruit in our own lives. And then, Lord, in the lives of the church and in this community, Lord, bless our children. It is not their fault. We are training them now, but we have been failing as adults and parents and as ministers. But Lord, you're not condemning us. You are calling us to you. You didn't call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's hope for us. I don't care how chaotic our life has been. You bring order out of chaos. Yeah. And so, Father, we want you to do this with our heart that's in shambles, our home that's in shambles, our church that's in shambles. And Lord, bring order out of chaos so that you will have a team that you can use to finish this work to the glory of your holy name. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, I hear the appeal and I want your power and your love so that, Lord, my mind, my thoughts can be changed, my life can be changed, and that I will come back and, and with no backsliding, conversion of my inmost soul. And you want that. You're asking for that. Then just raise your hand. You're saying, Lord, I want power. I want love. I want help. And you're just raising your hand and saying, dear God, help me today. Help me today. Father, we're raising our hands. I'm raising mine. If there's anyone on the Internet, Lord, this is not a joke. This is not just a, 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 a presentation. This is life and death. May everyone make a decision to raise, to surrender, so that this week will be the beginning of a new and deeper experience in our lives. Not just for us, but that we'll reach this city, 
this state, this nation, this world, that the end may come and we may live forever with you, O God. That we may know you as our prayer. Help us this week. Help us not to forget this covenant, this promise. But Lord, knowing that without you we can do nothing, but with you we can do all things. Thank you for what you have done today. In Jesus' name, amen.